everyone and thank you very much for joining us at our virtual pituitary conference. This event is part of our We Are Pituitary campaign, celebrating all those involved within the pituitary community. This is one of our pre-recorded sessions and you can find the full programme and other session information linked in the video description. You can also visit our website pituitary.org.uk forward slash virtual conference to find out more. We are delighted to be offering this event for free. However, if you would like to make a contribution, you can do so online, by text or over the phone. Please feel free to chat in the comments or on our social media channels and any further questions you may have, we will try to answer throughout the week or as soon after the event as we can. This morning, we are joined by Dr. Rob Murray, consultant endocrinologist and an honorary associate professor at the University of Leeds. He will be advising you how to prepare for attending your appointment at the Endocrine Clinic and an update on how consultations are being done throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Rob is also a member of our medical committee and we're really grateful to him for putting together this informative and helpful presentation for you all today. Hello. I'm uh, Dr. Rob Murray. I'm a consultant endocrinologist and honorary associate professor at the University of Leeds. Uh, today, I'm going to quickly going to guide you through your outpatient appointment in the endocrine clinic with a, obviously a real bias towards people who are coming to the pituitary clinic, um, as that's obviously what we're discussing today. So let me share our screen with you right i hope you can now see that um so you this is as i mentioned covering your endocrine visit uh obviously things have changed a lot for our patients over the last year during the time of the covid pandemic and uh whereas traditionally there would be uh attendance into hospital for appointments now just we're using a lot more telephone and video appointments uh really to cut down on contact between people and obviously sharing uh, and promoting the spread of the virus um it's been an interesting time and having done a lot of um telemedicine appointments um there's obviously pluses and minuses to them um, I think it depends on whether the individual who's coming to clinic is a new patient who we've not seen before or someone who we have seen on previous occasions and therefore know very well. And I think it's easier in follow-up appointments to catch up with people who we already know. And I think I prefer more face-to-face -face contact and that personal contact and interactions and trying to build that trust with people through a face-to-face -face appointment um initially when we see people so i sort of favor face-to-face -face appointments once we can get back to those for new patient appointments though i suspect a lot of people who have been under our care for a number of years and who are very stable now um may prefer to have the the option of going down the route of uh, telemedicine the advantages, as I mentioned, and disadvantages, it's difficult currently with telemedicine to visualize scans and to do diagrams of pituitary hormone loops and feedback loops and show how which hormones come from the pituitary in, in sketch diagrams that um, you can otherwise do. Uh, so I think we miss a little bit of that with the tele telemedicine. I think people have got more complex conditions uh, where we're changing tablets around and needing more interventions often at the beginning of their treatment, it's much easier to do in face-to-face -face and to be able to discuss the complex and different modalities that we might use um, uh, to manage their condition, I think is, is easier in a face-to-face -face setting. Telemedicine obviously is much more convenient. There's the cuts down all the travel, um, which is obviously very good. Um, and I think that's for both. So I think the convenience part of it is there. But there's also the, the difficulties of answer calls. So even though we have letters go out for appointments, we often have a number of with calls which remain unanswered. But there are people who um, answer calls on the second call. So I'm assuming they may think that I'm phoning for somebody that's trying to tell them they've had a, a car accident or uh, trying to see if they need to claim some PPI back. Uh, but after I leave them a message, they often answer the phone. Uh, really important that if you're on telephone or 
a video conference call to get somewhere that's quiet and confidential um, so that you can talk about things a bit more in depth without uh, people overhearing. So I think that's really important. Um, I've had one lady who's, uh, when we were having her consultation, had to um, stop the consultation because she had someone come into the shop that she was working in. Um, there's often background noise really important because it's difficult for us to hear on our end if there's a lot of background noise. Um, obviously, with younger uh, people looking after their children at home, uh, can create the background noise, so really important. Although telemedicine is here, um, I'm not sure this is going to get rid of the delays. Uh, people often being seen late when they come to face-to-face -to -face clinics. Uh, I suspect that will still happen because the doctors are still going to get called away uh, for emergencies. Uh, there still will be some individuals who need a lot more explanation and talking to than others, which may cause delays in the clinic. So I don't think we're going to completely resolve that uh, with the use of telemedicine. However, what we're going to concentrate on today is predominantly when you're coming to a face-to-face -face appointment, they will cover a little bit of the, the telemedicine appointments in, uh, as a byproduct. Um, so we're going to go through what you need to, but anything you might want to prepare for your appointment so, you, um, so you're ready for all the details you may want to tell us and for us to get from you. Um, also a little bit about attending your appointment and making sure that will go smoothly. The main bulk of it, obviously, the consultation, what happens afterwards, and then a quick bit at the end just around COVID and um, how that's influenced things. So what do you need for your appointment? Um, the most important thing, obviously, is you and your symptoms and the timing of those is often important. So thinking about the main symptoms that affect you, the ones that really are the ones that bother you and cause an impact on your life are, are the ones that are most important. Um, and the timing of those, when they started, how long they've been there for, again, is important. Medication important, not only um, medications that you might be taking for your pituitary problem, but also medications for other conditions are important because of potential interactions or even influences on your own hormone levels. Your past medical history, obviously we need to think about your pituitary disease holistically and in amongst anything else that you may have, other illnesses, et cetera, and how that may impact or evil may impact on each other. Uh, so we need to think about that. Um, we're increasingly recognising that there are genetic forms of uh, pituitary disease. It's still a minority of cases, um, but they're increasing year on year uh, that we understand more about uh, genetic parts of pituitary. It's important that you determine if there's anyone in the family who might have pituitary or other endocrine diseases. Um, Blood test. Should you have blood tests before you come so we're more informed about your hormone levels? I think they're very useful. There's two ways to have blood tests. It's either the basal blood test, which just means attending your GP surgery or having a standard blood test at the phlebotomy service, versus those where you come up to the endocrine day unit and we do more intensive tests to look at your hormones, and both of which we may plan beforehand. So people who we're considering and we know have been diagnosed with, uh, newly diagnosed with pituitary, and then we often get people up to the day unit and really assess all of their hormones before they come to see us in clinic, for example. Other people who are under regular follow-up, it's often useful to have their blood tests uh, just done with their GP or with the phlebotomy service at the hospital a couple of weeks before, so we've got um, and the numbers uh, ready and to discuss at the appointment. Timing. Uh, the blood tests generally, most blood tests nowadays for hormone levels, I would get back within the week. Um, but to be on the safe side, I think really at two weeks should get most of the, the results back to me uh, pretty reliably. Um, if they're taken in Leeds, uh, where I work, the results would be there and the turnaround within two weeks. And even in most of the smaller hospitals nowadays, their turnaround will be still within a couple of weeks to have those numbers back, I'm sure. Location makes a difference. We can see a lot of uh, blood results now electronically. So I can see all the results from across Leeds, but also Harrogate, Huddersfield, uh, Mid York's area, and even all the way up to South Tees, York, uh, down towards Sheffield and to Manchester. So we can see all of all those particular areas. 
However, just down the road from us is Bradford. It's a very large town. Um, and I can't see their results electronically. And so therefore, they will come back to me, blood test from Bradford, on paper. So important that uh, you know if the results that you're having, the blood test you're having, will come back either on paper or electronic, because electronic results will be easily visible, whereas the paper ones we may have to wait on bits of paper to arrive from another hospital, which may take a little more time. Also for your appointment, important that you think about what you want to get from, from the appointment. Um, and I suppose therefore it's thinking about your main symptoms and whether we can explain, be able to help improve those for you. And also questions, questions that you may want to ask, because often a lot of people, when they've come for the appointment um, and you ask if they have any questions, uh, sometimes have forgotten what they want to ask. So sometimes lists are helpful, but if, there are lists, it's important to keep it concise because most appointments are only 15 minutes for follow-ups and 30 minutes for patients who are new presentations. So there isn't a lot of time. So I think it's really important to think about the questions that are really important to you um, that impact on your symptoms or impact on your life and that you really want to know about. So I think really important, keep it concise, but bring them with you so that, so that you don't forget. When you get to your appointment, um, you would book in to say you've arrived in the hospital and in Leeds that would be done um, usually for an electronic system and you'd uh, register you've arrived and then you'd go to the clinic. Uh, and really important when you get to the clinic to let the clinic nurse know you've arrived because I've had people uh, wait for <clears throat> up to an hour not realising that they haven't um, been told, uh, that I haven't been told that they are there. Uh, so the nurse, usually when you arrive, the nurse, once she knows you're there, will bring your notes through to me so that, that, I, that I know you're there. Um, so really important that that's done. We are moving over to more electronic systems, so it should now on the, um, the computer be able to tell us who's arrived in the department. So hopefully the problems we've had in the past won't, won't happen going forwards. Who can you take with you to your appointment? Well, just about anyone you want. If you need someone there who can help you remember the conversation, who can provide the support you need for that, then I think really important you bring them with you. And I think that's the person, if you want someone with you, that uh, really is your choice, uh, not mine. I'm very happy to have um, a relative or a friend in the room to help support you and to try and help with the conversation. They may, may even have some questions about your condition uh, if there's time to help you with. Obviously, different, some differences during the coronavirus pandemic um, because a lot of the face-to-face -face appointments are being deferred um, where possible and we're moving over to the telemedicine, which we've mentioned already. However, uh, with that, most of the phone calls we do, we do are to mobile phones, which can easily put on speaker phones. So, Therefore, that conversation between myself and the patient can often be shared with a, a relative or friend um, to help with that consultation. When you get to your appointment, who, who are you going to see? Well, most of the endocrine units work as a multidisciplinary team with uh, several consultants, several registrars and nurses. Uh, traditionally, it's been a single consultant with their registrar um, working together and who would look after you. But there's a lot more um, places now which work in teams where there'll be several consultants and several registrars. And you may see anyone within that team on that day. So that may be one of several consultants or several registrars that you may see at your appointment, along with one of several specialist nurses. Um, there's obviously a gain, pluses and minuses to that. You lose a little bit of that continuity of care of the same person that you're used to seeing, but you do get different opinions um, on your condition and how um, we can treat your symptoms and, and different ideas come from that. And I think that's often helpful at times. Can you request to be seen by a particular consultant? Of course, I think if you arrive in the clinic, 
and wish to be seen by a surgical consultant, then do ask the clinic nurse who's there to say, could you potentially see a particular person? And uh, that's usually possible, but clearly, if that person already has a very busy list um, and a number of people to see, and a number of people ask on the same day to see that same person, it may not be possible, but no harm in requesting. Um, and generally, those requests can be sorted out the, the way you'd like. Um, in my clinic, after we finish the clinic, if you've seen the registrar or someone else within my clinic, we discuss everybody, every patient on my list who and the registrar's list, et cetera. And we go through all the patients and their management. And we discuss everybody after the clinic to make sure that we've not missed anything um, and to think about anything we could do different in management that we might even change uh, with a bit more thought and discussion. Um, so everyone gets discussed by myself and the team afterwards. And uh, um, obviously we can change things thereafter if we decide there's a better way to do, to do something than we've decided in the clinic. Obviously, if something urgent in the clinic, the registrars are happy to knock on my door and come and, come and talk to me within the clinic itself. Also within the clinic, you may be uh, seeing one of the research nurses or the research fellows may um, come and talk to you about studies we've got. And I think it's really important. We're trying to advance care of people with pituitary disease and improve that. And we continue to do so. There's new drugs coming on the market, uh, which we uh, are moving forward. So there's uh, growth hormone, which generally is a, a daily injection. There's weekly versions and even monthly versions that are going to have come through. There are new drug treatments for Cushing's disease that are coming through. And the injectable um, smash statin analog, octocytin and retired that we use in acromegaly, which is a once monthly injection. There's now a tablet form of this that's coming through uh, in research and to market. So things are continually developing and we're continuing to learn about pituitary disease and hopefully therefore improve care of patients we have now and patients in the future. The meat of it, the consultation. What the most important thing, what be discussed by you and the doctor. And I think the number one of all of that has got to be your symptoms and how you're feeling. Um, obviously, if you're someone who's new presentation to the clinic, you'll be telling us about what has happened, what symptoms have developed and for how long. And for people who have been before, if, if they had symptoms before, whether they've improved, whether they've worsened. Um, and if there's any new symptoms that have happened since their last visit. So really important. Medication is really important and, and not just the medication we take for the pituitary condition, but also for other conditions, because there's a lot of those that can influence the way the pituitary works, hormone levels and the, the drugs that we use. Uh, a few examples I've just put on the slide there, the co uh, combined oral contraceptive pill or HRT, the estrogen levels, if you take an oral estrogen, not patches, but orals as a tablet, um, can affect cortisol levels. So that you can get a higher cortisol levels than normal if you're taking oral estrogens. And that can confuse us if you've got um, adrenaline insufficiency, your cortisol levels, your own cortisol levels may look artificial high and you may be adrenaline insufficient, but we might not know it because the estrogens are making the levels look higher. Iron and calcium tablets interfere with absorption of thyroxin, so you get a redux, significant reduction in the amount of thyroxin, so it can drop the levels of your thyroid hormones if you're taking levothyroxine. Sertraline can lower thyroxin levels as well, so that's important. Um, so there are a number of drugs, and there's a lot more. There's other tablets which inhibit metabolism of cortisol, so the levels can go up. Others that increase metabolism of cortisol uh, and hydrocortisone, and so the levels of your steroids can go a little too low. So really important with no other drugs. As to hormone replacements, again, dosage is important, but also timing, particularly for things like your hydrocortisone replacement. We usually give hydrocortisone as a three times a day, 10 milligrams in the morning, five milligrams around lunchtime, five milligrams around early evening. But important to know where those times are because the time someone wakes up may be very different. Um, I have people that, I have a lady who's walking her dog at the minute at five o'clock in the morning when she has her first dose of hydrocortisone so that she doesn't bump into other people because uh, of the COVID pandemic we're currently in. 
which means if she takes her next dose of hydrocortisone at lunchtime, which is 12 to one o'clock, it's been about seven hours since the first dose, which is probably a little bit too long. Um, whereas other people, if they got up at nine o'clock, then the next dose, if it was 12 o'clock, would only be three hours, and it probably would be a little too short. So the timing and distance in between, important for us to discuss at appointments and figure out if it's a, about right for levels to overlap without the steroid levels going a bit too high from dose accumulation. But the appointment would also go through any blood tests that you may have had and explain what the hormone levels are uh, and then safety markers. Um, and also the imaging, we can show you scans of the pituitary gland and explain what's going on. So uh, really important. Whilst all that's going on, what would the doctor be thinking about? Well, he'd be thinking about three things really. The first of which is what is the cause of the pituitary problem? Um, is it a mass lesion such as pituitary adenoma? These are benign growths within the pituitary, which are relatively common. Um, but there's a number of other problems you can get, parapituitary tumours, so things like meningiomas and craniopharyngiomas. There are uh, developmental cysts within the pituitaries, like a Rafkis cleft cyst. We can get uh, congenital abnormalities of the pituitary and genetic problems. Uh, an empty cellar where the little box where the pituitary normally sits is actually missing most of the pituitary tissue. Uh, idiopathic, where we actually don't understand why the pituitary is not working, and that's much more common in children than it is in adults. How do we know what the cause is? Well, a number of things help us. Um, obviously, the history. Um, so there's a, for example, in individuals who, after pregnancy, can get an inflammation of the pituitary, we call a hypophysitis, which can damage the pituitary and stop it working. Also in pregnancy, the because the pituitary gets much bigger, if you then have a postpartum hemorrhage and lose blood and your blood pressure drops slightly, the pituitary can then be damaged um, permanently. We call that Sheehan syndrome and the pituitary stops working um, because it just drained the blood for too long, too quick, suddenly. Sarcoidosis is a multi-system disease and it usually presents with shortness of breath. And, um, but as well as the infiltrates in the lung, which can make you short of breath, you can also get them in the pituitary gland and hypothalamus, which can stop the pituitary from working and make it look a bit bulkier. The onset of pituitary disease is important because in childhood, um, the pathologies we see which damage the pituitary are different to those that we see in adults. So pituitary adenoma, which are one of the most common causes of pituitary stop and working in adulthood, are relatively unusual in children. But children get a lot more of craniopharyngiomas, they get the idiopathic problems we can't explain, and obviously more of the congenital and genetic problems. Drugs are important, not only as we mentioned earlier, but drugs can also cause uh, blood tests to look like hyperpituitaries. And so opioids such as morphine or even high doses of codeine can sometimes suppress the gonadotrophins most commonly. So they're the hormones that drive the ovaries and the testes and make that make those slow down so the testosterone levels and estrogen levels can be much lower. Uh, opioids can also lower the cortisol levels in some individuals, but less common, but it certainly happens. And then there's a new uh, class of drug called the checkpoint inhibitors, which we use in cancer therapy, which are highly effective in, in a number of um, cancers. Um, but one of their side effects is that they can cause an inflammation of the pituitary, and that usually leads to damage of the ACTH cortisol axis so that people then can't drive and make normal amounts of cortisol and that seems to be a permanent um, if it occurs it tends to be permanent and people are rendered uh, deficient in cortisol lifelong thereafter it's important to know these drugs but if we're thinking about causes of pituitary problems pretty much always will end up imaging uh, the pituitary gland either with ct scans or mr MR is much, much better definition at the, at the, in the area of the brain of the pituitary, so we do prefer MR, but obviously it's, it can be quite claustrophobic and it can be very noisy, and some individuals can't tolerate MRI scans. Um, so our second option would be that of a CT scan because it's a lot more open and easier to tolerate. Hopefully in the future we'll have a lot more of the open MRI scans, which will be much more acceptable to people as the magnets get stronger 
and these machines uh, will get better. The definition on them hopefully will get better and they'll become more prevalent. Um, but they certainly will be happening going forward to make that easier. Imaging of the pituitary, we can see we've got two scans here, the one on the left, um, these are normal pituitaries. Uh, we can see in the middle, just above the white, the black circle there, just above that, that's the pituitary gland. The two little black dots either side of it are the carotid arteries. So the bit in the middle there is the pituitary. Just above it is a little white line, which is going in an upward direction. And that's the pituitary stalk. So that's the little stalk by which the brain tells the pituitary how to work. The little dumbbell shaped thing at the top of that little white stalk is the optic chiasm. So that's the crossing over the nerves to the eyes um, just above the pituitary gland. And that's a normal pituitary. On the right hand side picture, that's a picture from the side of the pituitary. In the back of the pituitary gland, this little small area at the back of the pituitary, which is bright white, uh, is what we call the posterior pituitary. It's a lot brighter often than the front bit of the pituitary. So what can go wrong? These are pictures of small and big lumps in the pituitary, they're adenoma. So these are benign growths in the pituitary gland. Again, the picture on the left-hand side, we can see the pituitary gland in the middle. There's the black circle below it, which is the sphenoid sinus. There's the two little white, uh, black, two little black circles either side of the pituitary gland, which are the carotid arteries, and then the pituitary in between. In the pituitary gland, there's a small area on the left hand side of the screen, which is a little bit darker than the rest of the pituitary, and that's a microadenoma. So it's only about three millimeters in size, but that's a small little lump in the pituitary, benign growth. And that may be picked up incidentally on a head scan that is done for another reason, or from a secretory tumor. So someone that might have high growth hormone levels, or high steroid levels, or high prolactin levels. And we're looking whether there's a little lump within the pituitary that's causing it, and that's the microadenoma that might be the cause. On the picture on the right, that's a macroadenoma. That's a much bigger tumor. You can see the big lump there in the middle, in the middle, uh, and you can't distinctly see the nerves to the eyes. They're pushed up above it. So that person's got a big tumor. It's about two and a half centimeters, and it's pushing the nerves in an upward direction. So that person may well have visual field defect because those nerves have been displaced and compressed in an upward direction. And it would be important in that person to relieve that pressure and they're likely need operating on fairly soon. Craniopharyngiomas, you heard me mention earlier, these are more common in children, but you do see them as well in adults. And the peak in adults is somewhere about the age of 50 to 60 years. Uh, more common in children though, you can see in the picture on the left hand side, uh, a normal pituitary gland and above the pituitary gland is a fuzzy area, which is a bit of white in it, a bit of black, a bit of gray. And that's a craniopharyngioma because these have uh, bits of cystic fluid filled area. They have solid bits, they have bits of calcium in them. Uh, and so, and they're quite irregular in shape. And so they look a little bit fuzzy like that picture and different color, different shades of white and gray. In the picture on the right hand side, that's a bit bigger. You can't see the pituitary gland distinct from the craniopharyngioma in that picture. However, also on that one, you can see that the craniopharyngioma is bigger and it goes right up into the base of the, the brain there and, and pushes it upwards. And it's actually stopping some of the flow of the fluid around the brain such that the fluid in those cavities above um, can't flow forward. And that's why they look much bigger black areas in the middle of that picture there in the brain than on the picture on the left hand side. That's because they're filling up with that water, the CSF, and it can't drain because of the pituitary, uh, the craniopharyngioma pressing upwards and blocking the drainage of the fluid. Meningiomas are another tumor around the pituitary gland. So the meninges are a like the bag that the brain is surrounded by. Um, so it's the lining around the brain. The pituitary itself is actually outside of the brain. So the meninges lie above the pituitary gland and below the brain. So between the two, um, at the bottom of the pituitary stalk is a lining of uh, this uh, meninges. 
the sac that surrounds the brain and you can get benign tumors of this uh, lining and they're called meningioma and you can see in that picture there a big uh, gray area just below the nerves to the eyes there at the bottom of the stalk and it stretches all the way over to the right hand side of that picture on the right into the brain tissue um, and on the right hand side picture we're seeing from the top of the head um, and that's the same meningioma and you can see it extends on the brain often along the skull base um, on the bone at the bottom of the brain where the meninges lie um, and you can see it's growing backwards on the right hand side there um, that's quite extensive uh, mass Secondly, once we've thought about what the cause of the pituitary problem is, our next thoughts are around if you're missing any hormones. So the hormones that you could be missing, growth hormone, uh, which obviously makes children grow, but we often need in adulthood, otherwise we can feel quite tired without growth hormone. Uh, gonadotrophins are the hormones that tell the testes and the ovaries what to do. The two gonadotrophins are LH, luteinizing hormone, and FSH follicle stimulating hormone and they as I say then tell the testes to make testosterone and the ovaries to make estrogen. Thirdly is ACTH this is the hormone from the pituitary down to the adrenal glands it tells the adrenal to make cortisol so if damaged you don't make natural steroid cortisol. TSH tells the thyroid what to do so if that doesn't work you don't make the thyroid hormone levothyroxine. And then there's ADH antidiuretic hormone this is from that the posterior part of the pituitary, which is that little bright area we mentioned on the original scan. Without ADH, if you made no ADH, you would probably pass around 10 to 12 litres of urine a day. Um, however, sometimes when ADH is damaged, it's only partially damaged, and we see people are passing five, six litres of urine a day. Uh, but still quite a lot, um, but not as bad as if you've got no ADH. Obviously, if you're passing that much urine, it's easy to become dehydrated, so it can be dangerous um, if this does occur and it's uh, severe. How do we know if you're missing any hormones? Well, part of it's going to be symptoms. A lot of the symptoms from hormone deficiencies are uh, non-specific. So if you're missing growth hormone, gonadotrophins, cortisol, levothyroxine, all missing any of those can make you feel a little more tired. Non-specifically, but lots of people feel tired and it's not to do with hormones. So it's not something that would define you as having a hormone problem or hormone deficiency on its own. So there are some that are more specific. As I mentioned, the ADH, if you're passing six to 12 liters a day, we know that's probably a problem with your ADH. If your period stop, we know that's probably, a, and you've got pituitary problems, it's likely a, probably a problem with your gonadotrophins. So some of the symptoms are, are very helpful but others less specific. As endocrinologists, however, we love blood tests and hormone levels. And so there's a lot of blood tests and it's unusual to come to a point with an endocrinologist without getting a blood test either before or after. So we measure all of these hormones. IGF-1 is a marker of how much growth hormone you make. Um, LH, FSH, we've mentioned testosterone and estrogen are all useful to figure out the sex hormones. TSH is the drive to the thyroid, free T4, the thyroxine itself, and prolactin, all easy to measure on a blood test, either with the GP or the phlebotomy services in the hospital. It's important to recognize some of our hormones actually have quite what we call a down rhythm, so the levels vary quite a lot during the day. Testosterone, for example, is highest in the morning, and then it falls through the day, and it can, uh, from nine o'clock in the morning, through to the afternoon, the levels can fall by 40 to 50 percent, so quite significantly. So even a normal individual in the afternoon, if he has a blood test, could look as though he has a, a low testosterone level. So important that the measurement is done at the right time of day. Carbohydrates also reduce testosterone, so the blood test should be done fasting. Cortisol is very similar. The levels are high in the morning and they go down through the day. And by midnight, um, in most of us, are unrecordable. In the morning, the levels uh, can be quite variable because they're pulsatile, so they can go up and down quite quickly. Um, but levels less than 100 generally mean that there's a deficiency of cortisol. The levels more than 400 would generally be consistent with a completely normal cortisol production. 
Unfortunately, most people lie in the region of 100 to 400 nanomol per litre, and therefore it's a little more grey and we're unsure as to whether you have cortisol insufficiency or not. Where we need to know, um, then we undertake stimulation tests to stimulate your adrenal glands and your pituitary to see whether you can make normal amounts of ACTH and cortisol. And these are tests such as the insulin tolerance test, the glucagon test, and the short synaptin test uh, that uh, patients undergo. And these stimulate and drive your system uh, to make cortisol. Um, and obviously, if there's damage to it, you can't and the levels stay low. If it's normal, the levels will increase, and we generally see levels above 500 nanomol per liter in most of these tests. Both the ITT and the GST, the instantaneous test and the glucon stimulation test, also test your growth hormone. This is important, usually only where we're thinking about growth hormone replacement therapy. Um, IGF-1 levels are not an accurate determinant of how much growth hormone you make, unless you're um, a, a very young adult. When you're younger, IGF-1 is usually low if you're growth hormone deficient, but the majority of people with non-functioning pituitary tumors, which is our most common type of pituitary tumor, uh, occur in adults who are between about the age of 50 and 60 as, as the most common age group. And at that time, most individuals who are growth hormone deficient in that age group usually have a normal IGF-1, so it's not a sensitive test as we get older. So therefore, if we need to know if people are growth hormone deficient, we have to measure growth hormone itself. Growth hormone levels during the day and the majority of us, even in health, are unrecordable and very low. And so therefore we have to stimulate the growth hormone levels with these tests to know whether people can make it or not. But in the majority of cases, it's only worth doing that if we're thinking about whether growth hormone needs replacing. And the third thing the doctor will be thinking about during your appointment is whether if you've got a pituitary tumour, does it make too much in the way of pituitary hormones? We recognise that these pituitary tumours are made of cells that are usually there present in the pituitary, which is obviously a glandular um, tissue. And therefore, you can get a tumour that is made of growth hormone secreting cells or ACTH secreting cells, which would then stimulate too much cortisol to be made and give you Cushing syndrome. Uh, they could make prolactin or they could make TSH. Again, if you make too much TSH, that would drive the thyroid to make too much levothyroxine. How would we know if you have this? Well, two of these, the acromegaline, the Cushing's, um, both result in quite classic uh, clinical appearances and symptoms. And I think anyone who's worked in church disease for a long period of time would recognize patients with acromegaline and Cushing's um, uh, as being quite classical appearances quite easily, um, as long as they've had experience in, in this area. Um, and I think that's very helpful. Um, however, even if we recognize this clinically, we then need to prove the, the diagnosis of the blood test. And again, the blood test, uh, although growth from large F1 levels on a basal blood test aren't very helpful for growth hormone deficiency. They're usually very good for diagnosing acromegaly because the levels are often very raised um, and make the diagnosis obvious. For prolactinomas, you simply measure prolactin. And for TSH homers, again, just measure the TSH and the thyroid hormones, which both will be raised on basal blood tests. Prolactin, sometimes when the levels are only marginally radio, raised are a little more difficult because prolactin levels can go up in stress. Normal levels are up to about 500 uh, mu per litre, but with stress, the levels can often go up to about 1,000 or even marginally higher than that. So slightly raised prolactin levels, it's unclear whether it's stress or a small prolactinoma. What you can do is to take away that stress is to put a cannula in and let the person rest after the blood uh, cannula has been put in and then measure the prolactin levels over the next couple of hours to see whether the levels fall. Which, if they're stress related and relating to the blood test, then the levels will fall. If they're related to a prolactinoma, the levels should stay elevated. As we mentioned earlier, if you're missing a hormone, we try and stimulate you to see if you can make it. So where there's hormone excess, what we try and do is if you've got too much of it, we see it, if it suppresses normally. So for people, it's a growth hormone. If the growth hormone levels, again, growth hormone levels can go up in stress. 
But if you give a normal individual sugar, um, a sugar load, so as in the oral glucose tolerance test, then the levels of growth hormone will suppress. But that won't happen if the person's got acromegaly where they've got a tumor because the tumor doesn't respond to the sugar. Only the normal system does. Similarly for Cushing's, if we give a uh, synthetic steroid, your body will seize the synthetic steroid and stop making the natural steroid cortisol. However, if you've got Cushing's disease, the tumor within the pituitary gland won't shut down and stop making the AC, excess ACTH and cortisol, and therefore the levels will remain high. Once the consultations happened, the doc doctors thought about all of these items around managing your pituitary disease. This can then be taken forward with an individualized plan for the, for the person in question and where we need to go to next. And that uh, can be quite diverse in things we need to do. Um, there may be imaging, both from the point of view of diagnostics to find out why the pituitary is not working, or also surveillance imaging if someone's had radiotherapy or surgery to make sure that the tumor or any residuum doesn't start growing again. Visual fields are important, particularly at the beginning, because it's often something that if they're affected, we'd act on very quickly to try and lose, release any pressure on the optic nerves. So visual fields are really important. I often use them as well in older individuals who don't want surgery to their pituitary adenoma, which is often quite close to the nerves to the eyes, um, and only would have surgery should there be something that actually detracts from their quality of life, which obviously a loss of vision would do. So if we measure the visual fields um, and they become affected, it's more an indication to do something about the tumour than if there was a small bit of growth in the tumour itself that's not causing any problems um, on the imaging. So the imaging wouldn't lead us to doing anything, but a change in the visual fields may well do. So I think the visual fields can be very important. We obviously may need further blood tests. As I say, if there's a, we've got preclinic blood tests, if some of them are equivocal, we may need to go forward with a suppression test or a stimulation test to look at the hormones to see if there's too little or too much respectively. We also may need to think about starting hormone replacement therapies. If the blood tests have revealed that some of the hormones are missing, we may need to start replacement therapy. Or for people who are on it, we may need to adjust it, the timing of it or the dosage of it to get it right to improve a patient's symptoms. There may be medical therapies that we're using to control hormone excess. So we have drugs that can help lower prolactin levels and growth hormone levels and cortisol levels. And we may need to start those or again titrate and bring up the doses to bring the levels of hormones under control. There may be a need to refer people through either to the neurosurgeons for surgery to the church adenoma or, or, or craniopharyngeal or meningeal. Uh, for example, or we may be thinking about radiotherapy in some individuals, which may be even more conventional external being, in which people often come for a visit every day for a week, for usually around five weeks, or stereotactic radiotherapy, which is a much more focused radiotherapy, which we tend to use more of nowadays, and is only a single shot, uh, so it's much simpler. And of course, in a lot of individuals who have been attending the clinic for a while where we have hopefully optimized the dosage of their medications as best as we can. Um, and they've undergone a lot of imaging, which may show things have stabilized. Um, it may be that we change very little in those individuals and continue with the current management as long as all looks to be reassuring on some of the blood tests that may have been done before the clinic. So finally, in that discussion, um, once we get to the end of the consultation, there's a discussion if there are any new medications, talking over side effects um, of any medications so people could be aware of anything that could happen. There's a lot of medications which all have different side effects, so it's a little too much for us to discuss in this talk today, um, and hopefully we'll be covered in some of the other talks that you'll have during the um, meeting. Also, there's the opportunity to ask questions, and I think this is a really important part of it to, to ask questions around any symptoms you may have, whether we the doctors feel that they relate to your pituitary disease and could improve them, but also um, 
parts of this that may impact on life. So if they're going to try trophins are affected in someone in a younger adult, will it affect their fertility and discussions around that? Because um, obviously if there's no drive to the testes or the ovaries, then um, fertility will be reduced and there may be the need then for um, referrals onto the reproductive medicine unit to help on that front. Um, Pituitary disease on its own um, will mean the ovaries and the testes aren't driven uh, if they've damaged the gonadotropins, but uh, uh, there's therapies obviously we can give to try and improve that so it's not infertility because assisted fertility techniques can help. There's also the impact on driving. If you've got a visual field defect, this is obviously going to need to report into the DVLA and uh, obviously really important from the point of view of driving and work, so we'll have an impact on that. Finally, uh, on leaving the clinic and people have got adrenal insufficiency and cortisol, insuffi uh, cortisol insufficiency, there's the opportunity, usually in most units, the endocrine specialist nurse can undertake the teaching. We certainly try and do that in Leeds for our patients that attend. And if they've been newly diagnosed with cortisol insufficiency or adrenal insufficiency, whichever term, um, they're rather synonymous, um, you wish to use, then we can get the teaching done, hopefully on the same day around sick day rules and how to increase the steroids, both for infections, but also for physical and emotional stresses. Um, make sure people have an emergency pack and that they know how to inject and mix up uh, the hydrocortisone, uh, that they have a steroid card and hopefully also a medical alert. Uh, so they're provided with information around all of, all of those areas. I think it's really, really important that someone close to you, often preferably someone that you live with or who's with you a lot of the time. Um, I find a lot of patients that have true uh, adrenal crisis that are quite severe, often at those times are unable to mix up and administer their own hydrocortisone emergency pack. So it's therefore important that either someone with them uh, or close to them has the ability to do that and knows about it so that they can do that uh, for them. Um, most paramedics uh, nowadays also should be able to do that, but um, Obviously, it can be administered earlier and quicker uh, should someone with you be able to do it for you. At the end of the consult consultation, there will also be an idea of well, what your next surveillance and appointments are going to be. Clearly, if you're stable and just undergoing annual uh, just surveillance and all your hormone levels are stable, the tumour is being controlled and we're not having any concerns, we're likely to see you on an annual basis. And I suspect most people will get to the stage where we're seeing them on an annual basis. Early on in treatment, uh, where we're increasing doses of hormones uh, or drugs to reduce hormone levels, we're likely to see people every six weeks to three months until we get those levels perfect and all the hormone replacements are right and any drugs that we need to control hormone levels are also optimized. And then the frequency of seeing people will extend from there. Pituitary adenomas grow relatively slowly. And so uh, from the point of view of imaging, we generally only undertake this on an annual basis. If there's a pituitary adenoma or a parapituitary tumor, such as meningioma or craniofringioma, which is near to the nerves to the eyes that we're concerned about, we may do an earlier scan at around uh, three to six months to see if there's any particular progression or growth of that. Clinic letters. Um, after your appointment, a letter is always done detailing uh, the diagnosis, the test that, and results that have been done, uh, what's been discussed at the appointment and the management going forwards uh, to provide to your GP. This is often full of a lot of technical and medical jargon, but the letter should be copied um, also to uh, the patients to make sure they have all that information. Obviously being full of jargon, it may be a little more difficult to understand, but pretty much everything nowadays can be figured out with Google um, if there's a word we don't understand. Following the clinic, um, 
the one of the most important things is to establish contact with our with the endocrine specialist nurses. They are generally the key worker and the first point of contact for people should they have any problems before their next appointment or something untoward happens they need to let us know about. Uh, so really important. All the endocrine specialist nurses working in various hospitals will probably have a dedicated phone number and a direct line without going through switchboard. It's important to when you attend the clinic to obtain uh, a number for an easy contact. Obviously, a lot of that will be um, to an answer phone because the nurses obviously have other things that they will, they will be doing. So they, they obviously run their own clinics. Uh, our nurses do growth hormone placement clinics. They do the steward education clinics. They help out with the testing in the endocrine day unit, um, as well as doing teachings for steroids. So they're, they're very busy. So they may not get back to you immediately, but as, as long as you leave a message, hopefully they'll get back to you. They're obviously much easier to find than myself, however, but if the nurses ever need any advice from me, they, they know where I am and can find me somewhere else in the hospital. If you get admitted to hospital, uh, should you be letting the endocrine team know? I think if you're on steroids or DDADP, which is the one we use for the antidiuretic hormone replacement, so desmopressin, I think it's probably it's important that we know that you're in hospital. Um, if you're coming in for elective or emergency surgery, obviously your steroid dosage will need to be increased. And I think it's important, therefore, that we liaise with the surgeons and help guide your perioperative management and what to do with the steroids. Similarly for DDADP, they often don't have the desmopressin product that you'll be on, either desmotabs or inhaled um, or the nasal DDADP. Uh, on the wards so uh, it can be delayed and I think it's really important it's dangerous not to have the dosage of your DDABP um, and therefore I think if you can let the ward team know that we're involved and ask them to contact us we can often expedite that and explain how important receiving the desmopressin is. Um, both of those missing the steroids or the desmopressin can be dangerous and I think it's really important that um, the endocrinology team are aware that you're in hospital and can help with your, your management during their other illnesses if you're not on an endocrine ward. Finally, a little bit about COVID. Uh, originally, we had COVID all kicked in back in uh, a year ago now, so it would have been March 2020. There was lots of debate about who should undergo shielding for 12 weeks. Um, and who shouldn't and where particular groups of patients would be uh, placed. Um, there was lots of discussions at the Society for Endocrinology around the groups, uh, at the group, particularly around adrenal insufficiency, which we thought were probably our most vulnerable individuals. But after a meeting with the Royal College of Physicians, NHS England and Society for Endocrinology, um, it was decided that people with adrenal insufficiency would be in the strongly advised group. So that means strongly advised against social mixing, strongly advised against friends and family coming to the house, strongly advised to use remote access to the NHS, strongly advised to avoid public transport, and strongly advised to work from home. Uh, and I think that remains our uh, advice uh, for people with adrenal insufficiency. Reassuring, I don't seem to have seen more patients with adrenal insufficiency being admitted to hospital to date. Um, so I think we probably have it right. But some of that may be that uh, people with adrenal insufficiency have probably been very sensible and have taken uh, the advice um, and really have avoided contacts uh, more than some of the rest of the population over this uh, time. Vaccinations. Uh, COVID vaccination is uh, clearly safe, along with all other vaccinations. There's no worries about being on steroids and having vaccinations. Uh, the steroid dose we use in people with adrenal disease is usually between 15 and 20 milligrams. Uh, so it's a replacement dose. It's not a dose that we'd use for immunosuppression. Um, for example, um, as I said, people on replacement doses 15 to 20 milligrams a day. If I saw an asthmatic who came into hospital and we gave them hydrocortisone for their asthma, we would give them somewhere between 400 and 600 milligrams, probably in the first 24 hours. So much, much higher doses with, when we're talking treatment and immunosuppressive doses compared to what replacement doses are. 
So it should be your dose of taking hydrocortisone 15 to 20 milligrams a day should be equivalent to my natural production of cortisol or hydrocortisone. Cortisone and hydrocortisone are the same thing, um, different names, same molecule. Um, so your hydrocortisone dose is the same as my natural hydrocortisone or cortisol. Not only the COVID vaccine, though, this is the same for all vaccinations. There is no reason that you should be concerned over having vaccinations if you're adrenally insufficient. Um, they're safe. Clinic cancellations, final things. These have been obviously a lot of delays and cancellations over the COVID period, uh, which is understandable sometimes with the fast changing environment, we've been pulled onto the ward uh, with just um, notice that it's happening one week and so we're on the ward the next week. So it's been difficult really to run much of an endocrine service through, through much of this, or certainly one that's a bit more structured. We had a period in the first um, wave of the virus where actually all of the activity uh, was shut down in our department for around three to four months, uh, which has led to quite a notable backlog, backlog in patients, which we are uh, through the second and third wave of this. Um, we've managed to keep the, a lot of the clinics still running. Um, so hopefully now we're trying to catch up again. <clears throat> Uh, clinic appointments otherwise um, often cancelled um, at some point. That's usually due to doctors being on leave, either the, the registrar or the consultant for either study leave or annual leave. Um, most doctors go twice a year to a meeting to keep up to date to a national meeting um, to catch up on new data around the conditions. And obviously that's very important uh, to do. Um, and obviously holidays as well. We have to give in Leeds eight weeks notice for any leave, either for study leave or annual leave. Um, and it really should give the, the administration time, therefore, to make sure that we don't appoint people um, to our patients um, and then need to cancel them. Uh, unfortunately, it never works as smoothly as it should do. Um, but that's part of it. Um, there's always going to be doctors who come become unwell or sick, which leads to cancellation, but that's uh, much, much less common, uh, fortunately. A lot of the delays um, in the NHS clearly relate just to sheer numbers of people that we need to see and get sorted out. And obviously that's been exacerbated by COVID, but hopefully uh, we will now start as the COVID numbers hopefully are coming down, hopefully we'll be able to start getting on top of that again. Right, I think that's everything I have to say uh, around attending your endocrine appointments. Um, I think important aspects, think about what you want to get from the appointment, uh, questions that you want to ask, um, and particularly in relation to how things may impact on your life in terms of things like driving, fertility, um, etc., um, work and how that might influence particular things in in your life. And I thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.